Yeah, that's good to hear. So Flat Earth kind of had more ramifications in your life than just uh, the, the shape of the Earth, I guess, yeah. if, it, if it could make <laughs> you think that kind of, that's interesting. So what, how, how did you go from Flat Earth to not wanting to drink anymore? And what other kinds of odd side effects did Flat Earth have? Yeah, a lot of flat earth side effects for sure, um, which is why I love when people say that question, oh, why does it matter? Why does it matter, Chris? Um, and I tell them, like, you know, it changed everything in my life, you know. So for me, I found out about flat earth kind of on my own because of my architectural studio. And I, I was taking this master class and, um, you know, the professor was, you know, kind of off in La La Land every day. Right, she she was on she was on something, right? But she had us study um, basically the violet hours of the sunlight, and everything like that. Um, and we were proposed to build, you know, some sort of residential or architectural design based on those extreme violet hours of 18 degrees of you know sunlight towards the horizon. Um, so we spent months out in you know kind of the middle of West Texas, uh, one of the flattest places ever, right? I mean. There's actually a joke out there that says you can watch your dog run away for two weeks because it's so flat. Right? Mm. Um, so, I mean, it, they even call it kind of the the ocean sky, right? Because there's just so much sky uh, seemingly out there. No hills, no mountains, no nothing. Right. So it's just kind of this place where you're like, I wonder how far that really is. Um, but in my architectural studio, I started, you know, measuring the temperature of the moon, measuring the temperature of the sun at these specific angles. And noticing when they were really big at the horizon, noticing when they're really small. And, you know, I was just kind of flabbergasted with the rest of my studio mates, like, hey guys, I don't I don't think things are adding up here, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. And I wasn't necessarily saying flat earth, but even in 2012, you know, with the Mayan calendar and um, you know, the end of the world is coming, I started looking into, you know, those cosmologies and realizing like, and all these guys like had a had a flat earth cosmology, right? And, um, you know, that's kind of strange. And I was starting, I was already somebody who didn't watch TV or, you know, you know, 7-Eleven was a part-time job as as we coined it on the server. Um, you know, I was already awake to those kind of things. So this was starting to step up. Um, I was already starting to lose friends because I was like questioning sort of my reality. I was, you know, really open about it you know because that's what you're supposed to be in architectural studio you're supposed to share your ideas your designs your your thoughts your aspirations so you know i was sharing this like guys i think the earth is flat <laughs> you know, kind of thing and um yeah you know they're just like they they couldn't couldn't handle it right in any way they i lost my friendships um mm. you know because we'd always drink everybody parties every weekend uh it's college after all um but you know, everybody slowly started to stop hanging out with me. But I had, you know, that's where I found out who my real friends were, because I had one friend in there who was kind of, you know, keeping an eye on me as well, doing the experiments with me and going, yeah, that's it's really weird. Why is the moon cold? Like, you know, we just couldn't get past it. Um, I think it was like November uh, 2014 comes around and he goes, dude, you have to see this video. My brother, my stepbrother sent me, you know, kind of thing about 200 proofs that the, the earth is flat. And I was like, oh my gosh, let, let's watch it. And we sat there, turned off the lights, and just watched the whole thing right there. And, you know, as soon as it was done, I was like, I'm not crazy. Like, <laughs> you know, like, I told all of you guys, like, you know, uh, of course had that kind of ego boost from it. Um, it. It's of course died down, I think. Um, Cause I, I do think you kind of have this ego death, um, especially when you realize that you know, the globe is not a globe. Um, and that, of course, and all your friends, all your friends everything. leave you and suddenly yeah. they all think you're crazy. And yeah, the idea of being able to maintain an ego after that is really difficult. Uh, yeah, I don't know exactly what the meaning of ego is, but I definitely feel like flat earth awakening has a dampening effect on the ego in the sense of it humbles you. Yeah. And, and it it, it prepares you for nuance and it, it gets you ready to be character assassinated and like all of these things that most people have a bunch of defense mechanisms i guess ego defense mechanisms built up around and exactly to be able to come out about some of these things especially 
a flat earther really has a ego destroying quality about destroy is that the word ego i mean yeah. it it seems to be a ego they say about having a healthy ego you got to have some some exterior some persona or whatever some mask or something that you give to society but ultimately what we're doing here as truthers is taking off those masks not having a persona trying to be our authentic self and what could be more so that than when you hold a completely contrary opinion from everyone else in humanity that's going to call you crazy for holding that opinion yet you feel that you have so much evidence and proof uh, and common sense and lived experience backing this thing that you're just going to stand on this firm foundation of flat earth and be the crazy guy or whatever it yeah. takes and that's kind of what i've felt and i don't know that i had much of an ego before this but yeah now after <laughs> being you know one of the most uh, ridiculed people on the internet for better oh, part of man. a decade <laughs> yeah i don't know yeah. how you deal with that stuff it's <laughs> i've seen it i've read it i've been like what's your problem <laughs> like, and then, of course it's that ego you know it's all ego from them right right so there is an aspect to that i like hearing it when other people uh mention it so yeah tell, tell me more about that because like so you lose friends you're drinking buddies so that maybe that has part of talking about the side effect of now you don't drink anymore because maybe you don't have those friends anymore yeah. <laughs> you're going to drink alone about the globe <laughs> well, well then i find out too that these friends they weren't really my friends anyway you know some of my good friends were like oh yeah they're, they're talking crap about you about this whole flatter stuff the 7-eleven stuff all, all you know just you know anything and it's funny because it was a part-time job <laughs> <laughs> took me a second <laughs> yeah on the on the server you know um we have to kind of we say coco right instead of cv uh, okay. which is funny my initials are cv so i'm like man of right. course this had to be the thing right um but you know we use jibby jab you know we, we definitely yep. have all that lingo yep. um but yeah in my sort of architectural days i mean at least studying my masters at the flattest place ever you know, I was losing friends, um, you know, because of Flat Earth, but at the same time, I was realizing actually much more special connections with the people that I did trust and were with me uh, sort of in this. Uh, they wanted to figure it out, too. And, you know, even that that same friend, we were still best friends today and we, we still talk about, you know, of course, Flat Earth, except he kind of went all QAnon on and I was trying to give her like, no, dude, stop. Like, <laughs> like Trump's going to uh, save us. Don't even worry about <laughs> the shape of the earth. <laughs> exactly um and it's just not the case you know i've never never believed in politics whatsoever um i mean i was kind of fortunate too my my father was somebody who who taught us the bible every day and scripture and things like that but he was also like this is all an allegory right this is actually he'd be like you're jesus christ and i'd be like i'm jesus christ <laughs> you know kind of thing but he would uh he taught us how to astral project he taught us um, you know, how to lower sort of and just meditate. It was kind of this Eastern philosophy slash Western philosophy. I don't know. I was honestly a kid and I just trusted my dad. Um, but I was pretty fortunate now that I look back at it that I'm like, yeah, I definitely don't think it was this dude, right, that everybody gets really stuck on. And I'm like, well, what about the words of this book? You know, it even says that it's it's all allegory and it's actually a little bit more special that way. So I've always kind of been on the fringe, right? You know, because I've, I've had religious friends and I get along with, of course, everybody. Um, you know, I bring it up, you know, kind of when necessary or, you know, when they ask me. Um, so I was already kind of used to being sort of the fringe guy, you know. Oh, everybody kind of looks at Chris. Ask Chris about 7-Eleven, you know. Hmm. Uh, he'll tell you, what do you mean there's no planes? You know, let's look at the footage, you know, <laughs> kind of things like that. Um, which has been really great for being a professor now. Uh, so uh, I could definitely talk about that. Um, but yeah, you know, the side effects of Flat Earth um, was, of course, not only this ego death, but questioning what am I doing, right? It was sort of this revamping, because I think a lot of people, when they discover that it's not a globe, is they go, OK, well, what about the moon? What about the eclipse? What about all that, you know, and you start realizing you have all these things you don't know anymore that you thought you knew, or at least were like, yeah, that's figured out. Everybody knows. Um, so it was kind of, I think that's maybe where that humbling comes in. Like, I don't know. Right. And 
you know, I stopped saying believe, I stopped saying global, I stopped saying, you, know, you start to change your vocabulary, you know, because you're, you become that much more self-aware, right? You, you know, we have this conversation even in Discord, like, what does consciousness mean? And I'm like, well, that's, that's a really good one, because I think it kind of just means everything. And, you know, I think we're all kind of at a general understanding that evolution is completely fake, but you could have the evolution of sort of consciousness, right? As a five-year-old, you burn yourself, and then suddenly you change your consciousness. You, you kind of have this awakening moment where you're like, "Oh crap! I know what hot and cold is now." You know, but you kind of have these all throughout your life. So I would say flat Earth was kind of that next really big step of that, this spiritual evolution or whatever you want to call it, because some people hate the word evolution. Um, and it it's almost like coming out of a cult, I think. Yeah, the, because it, you said you're you're opening your mind to these new things, things you thought you had concrete answers for. You're reanalyzing that and realizing that actually I don't know these things that I thought I knew. I was actually acting more on assumption and appeal to authority and other other logical fallacies actually, and thinking I knew things that I don't know. And then when you get back to the things that you actually can know. That's when flat Earth actually comes into full view because it's it's common sense, empirical, direct realism. It's actually measurable, testable, and repeatable. Unlike the majority of things that you're taught about the globe and astrophysics and everything, these are just theories um, that you can't personally go to the seashore and test or take up a hot air balloon or a, you know a airplane or whatever. A, a zoom camera and use these actual practical instruments to find out for yourself if the eight inch per mile squared exponential curvature on a globe 24,900 uh, miles in circumference actually exists and you can do it yourself and figure these things out so it's it's a lot like well I mean it truly is it's not even like <laughs> You're in a cult. You're in a cult. Uh, a You're world born into it. It's not your fault. You know, it's a okay, global, man. a global cult yeah. that everyone believes in, and you think that this is reality, and you think that it's solid science until you find out it's not. And it would be just like any other religion or cult that you were born, grown up into, indoctrinated into, and then suddenly, you, you know, slowly you start seeing holes in what the clergy is telling you or what the holy book says and uh, and things like that until you finally say wait a minute and then you come into your own again rather than being fully in whatever the group think uh, knowingness is right. of that you pull out into your own skepticism and now you don't know and it's a whole new place of agnosticism and it for me lifelong agnosticism about most things is the truest position you can hold. Um, when you to, to give a knowledge claim, you really need to have a solid foundation. But uh, flat Earth is one of those things. It, it, surprisingly, <laughs> is one of the main things you can know in this life yeah. is that the Earth is flat. It's like amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and you know, I would say most people know or they don't want to know, right? right. But there's definitely that that feeling on the server. But yeah, you know, just to kind of keep it in that that flat Earth side effects because it was definitely something that you know that that self reflection, that that ego that you have to have to claim knowledge about something is even kind of hard to say. Um, but it, it it sparked a whole interest of things of just like you said, like I. I no longer have to look to other authority, I can be the authority. And I think for a lot of people, they have a really hard time going, I'm the authority? You know, like, are you human? Yes. Are you of stable, sound mind? Yes. Okay. So you can think for yourself. And they're like, oh, wow, I can't think for myself, you know. Um, but in, in that regards, you know, I was always working a nine to five life, right? I was always working to, you know, kind of keep myself in school. and. Um, you know, some other people, they had their parents' wealth and, you know, all this stuff, but I was always kind of working hard for it, working two jobs or, you know, just doing whatever I needed to do to make things work. Um, but then I also realized, you know, I don't have to do this either, right? Like, I don't have to waste my time for not even $10 an hour, you know, trying to do all this extra work and prove myself and all this stuff. And I go, no, I already know how to do this. I'm going to start my own business and my own design firm. Um, and so I did. 
I, you know, learned how to make an LLC. It apparently wasn't that bad. Um, but this was also learning about the fiat currency money, right? This was also learning about the straw men that are created. And then I was going, well, can a straw man be a good thing? You know, can I make these straw men for myself that aren't really me? So I don't get taxed, but they get taxed because they get better tax deals, you know, um, and trying to basically use this system, at least at the, at the time being, as much as I hate it, as much as I would agree that government is mind control, um, that there's something about small government, like that local government, that up to 5,000 people, that it's this family, right? Um, that I've really noticed with Flat Earth too, um, especially on the Discord, right? Just because you have these people that were like me, sort of realizing, hey, I have the authority, um, and then also realizing that you had no one else, nobody else to talk to about it, right? And if you did, um, you know, it might damage some sort of relationship or work um, or something, right? So. The Discord actually became, I, I think, a unique sanctuary uh, for a lot of flat earthers, a lot of truthers, a lot of people who just want to ask questions, um, you know, to come together. And it's definitely, you know, we're at 30,000 now, not that we're all on at the same time. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's a good hundred of us that come in every week, right, and you know, talk with these globies. Um, you know, I hate to call them globies, we call them normies, I mean, there's all kinds of names out there. They, they call us flurfs and flat earthers, so I'm at least trying to be nice. But, um, you know, we, we try to help them, right? And we've all sort of gone through this step-by-step -step ego death, this step-by-step -step not knowing something, testing something for yourself, because that's exactly right. You can't go test the thermite, you know, at the, at the bottom of the building. However, you can test the footage, right? You can look at it frame by frame. So it's not like there isn't evidence of some of these things, but yeah, it's that, that clear crystal, hey man, let's go to the beach. You wanna set it up one day? Let's go do it, right? Um, that really helps our, our side, right? To, to say the very least. Because, uh, you know, I was listening to the uh, Billy, Billy Zig last night, um, and I was like, dang it, all the stuff I wanted to talk about. Um, but it, it's exactly right, you know, it's, it's this thing that you can prove for yourself because a lot of the times on the dis Discord server, we lay out this information, we lay it out very nicely, all this, all, you know, here's this, here's that. We're not trying to convince you. In fact, we know that we can't even convince you, <laughs> you know, like we can't go into your mind and go here and change some things around, change that gear. No, you're not a robot, you know, you're the only person that can actually drink that water or go through that door, as they say. Right. Um, and the, the thing, the doorway that appears for each person is totally unique. Yeah. There, there's no like one home run proof of the flat earth that you tell to everyone and they're like, now I get it. That is proof because that's all it takes is one proof and there's endless amounts of them to the point that William Carpenter came out with 100 and I doubled it to 200. And somebody out there hopefully is trying to double mine right now because it's easily done. And yeah. you can just come out with so many of these proofs, but, you know, the one that gets it, that opens somebody's eyes is always different from person to person. It's fascinating to hear, like, what was the thing that really got to you that made you understand Flat Earth? And it's always a, you know, th there's so many different ones, but it's, it's amazing to see how we're all so unique and what sticks in our mind and what makes us... Um, skeptical you know it, it's like i said it's always that one hole that appears in the seemingly uh um you know the fabric of, of your reality that seems like there isn't any hole in it and then you're like what is that right there huh wait a minute that just that just ruins this whole fabric here <laughs> i'm gonna throw it out <laughs> and try again happens, yeah. imagine, i mean it usually takes plenty of holes until it looks like swiss cheese before you're ready to throw it out and it should um, because uh, you don't want to change your whole fabric of reality from one hole, but that's how it always begins, is you have this, you think you know, like you said, you think you know something until you can see that one thing that, that doesn't seem right. I, maybe I don't know this thing. And so you said about the Discord, what's the name of your Flat Earth Discord, and how long have you been running that now? So I haven't, I'm... Um... You know, there's definitely a hierarchy, right? Um, from what I'm told, it started in 2015. 
it was part of the sort of ODD crowd. Um, he's kind of long gone from it, and of course it kind of just you know uh, expanded from there. Um, but yeah, it's 24/7 Flat Earth Discord. Um, we we've actually got the Flat Earth sort of uh, subtitle. So if you did like Flat Earth or Discord.gg slash Flat Earth, right? So definitely really easy to remember. But what's cool about it is that it's 24/7. So we live stream it on YouTube 24/7, and um, we we get a lot of people, of course, uh, some traffic from YouTube. We live stream it on Twitter, TikTok, Rumble, um, a lot of different places. You know, and it's kind of different different timings for rooms and things. You can say a lot more on Rumble than you can say on YouTube. So sometimes we'll have like, you know, video chat with everybody, ask, you know, ask the flat earthers some questions, you know, kind of things like this. Um, but it's a really good time because everybody kind of has their part. It's completely voluntary, right? Nobody's getting paid to do any of this. Um, and it's all flat earthers. So there are some other servers that are flat earth servers, but you have these, these Globers that are moderators and you know, they do weird fishy things to each other. And it's just like, we don't want any part of that. You know, we try to minimize drama as much as possible. Um, Cause let's face it, there's there's quite a bit even in Flat Earth. And um, even for some of these people who like, you know, just came into Flat Earth in 2020, I'm like, hold your horses. Like you got, you got a lot of stuff to learn. <laughs> you know, there's this thing called uh, controlled opposition and it's a very real thing. And if you weren't here since 2013, um, you don't really know about all the characters and you know i even have my my thoughts on sergeant right you know how it's still like the top 10 videos and i'm like come on man like and i remember when your stuff came out and i remember when clues came out and i was like it, it was weird like you know like you had to be there you had to see it pop up on your feed and be like who the hell is this guy you know um it's really tough to be in in my <laughs> position with all this as well because i've lived through it all and been the target of it all yeah. yet meanwhile i've got people of varying um you know degrees of knowledge and experience in this field coming into it trying to get me to play kumbaya and and sing songs around the campfire with these people that i have personal histories with that they don't know about and then i've also like an eagle over the flat earth movement <laughs> have been watching <laughs> Uh, what people do, what they say, and the effects of their actions and their words on things. And, you know, a lot of these people, they don't see that. And so for them, it's just like, no, we all have to get along. Everyone's equally honest and genuine and, uh, you know, as valuable to the community as everyone else and all this stuff. It's like, no, there's, there's definitely a hierarchy just like in everything else. And there is a lot of nuance to the whole thing. And even the people that I might uh, point fingers at I don't it's it's not black and white to me it's it's all shades of gray and I really think that people have their own personal motives and some people are more on the side of humanity and truth and everything and other people veer more towards their own personal interests and motives and opportunistic things like that and that's my view of the community. It's very nuanced and to the point that I don't really like talking about individuals anymore because it just too you bogged down in the nuance of what everyone is is doing. It is shades of gray and everyone starts to make you look like the bad guy too. And it's like, I'm not the bad guy here. Man. And everyone needs to come to it for themselves. They have to, you know, you can't tell somebody this guy's a shill, that guy's a shill. It just ends up being this finger pointing thing that gets you nowhere. Um, even though I would say that in all of these movements, there are things that you could call a shill. There are paid operatives. Uh, they have been outed before in these movements. Um, so, I mean, they exist. And to act like they don't exist um, is just naive. And so you have to ask that question um, and try and uh, act accordingly. Yeah. So, I mean, it's definitely something I like to come in with just because I'm one of the, you know, OG guys kind of there. Um, and I like to talk at least about the history when somebody doesn't know about it, right? That, you know, there's this thing called IFERS. Did you know that you know, Eric took that on and that somebody had that before him and that somebody had that before him? And this is kind of where that started. And then if you take a look at IFERS, there's actually a lot of information there, just like this Discord. 
which is another way reason I kind of like the server too is it's a um, it's a collective of everybody's information. You know, I used to not talk at all. I was the guy. Um, I think I heard it actually in one of your videos too. I stood in the corner. I watched everybody else. You know, I didn't say a word. You know, but I knew that guy and I knew how he picked his nose and I, I knew that guy and that he sits weird like this. You know, and um, so I was always extremely observant. Um, and I'm kind of like that in the in the server as well, until you know something needs to be said. Um, but I don't know. I would say I'm extremely introverted in that mm -hmm. way. But of course, getting better at it, you know, so, you know even working up to talking to, to Eric today. <laughs> um, I'm, a, I'm a introvert as well. Have you ever taken that uh, Jungian test? I forgot what they're called. Uh, Sixteen the, personality. That one, yeah. Is it yeah. Myers Briggs? Myers Briggs. No, I think that, I'm yeah. an INFJ. Me too. That's Supposedly it. Supposedly the rarest one. Supposedly. Like, everybody's an ISJ. <laughs> but everyone is. My mom is too. Like, <laughs> my mom is too. No kidding. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. And she's uh, ambidextrous too. She's she's kind of funny. She can write with both hands. Uh, it's just it's, it's so weird that way. Yeah. But I mean, to a T though, myself and my mom and um, Hitler apparently another yeah. INFJ. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess we're deep feeling introspective uh you know thinkers that uh, we we judge the world but uh we don't necessarily come right out there and say what we think immediately <laughs> yeah we're, we're like the um the ponderers we're, we're the ones that sit back and reflect on things before going out there and making what we've been pondering known <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah, I mean, it, it's not a death sentence either. Being an introvert, or what your astrological sign, or your what, what whatever these are, your your I Ching, they're more just um, where you're at naturally, and by knowing it, it's no longer fate. You can now change what comes naturally to you if you think that some other path would be more advantageous. So, for instance, it comes natural for me to be like a perfectionist and a um, critical, critical thinker, a criticizer as a Virgo. You know, two main things would be that uh, you're very, you're overly critical and overly perfectionistic. Okay, so I can now, I mean, that's, yep, that's me. But then what? You can either concede yourself to that fate for the rest of your life, or you can recognize that again shades of gray rather than being this black and white person that always wants to strive for the white i have to be perfect and i'm <laughs> overly critical about anything that's not the the lightest shade of white uh now i try to temper myself and realize that about myself and try to not you know not not everything needs to fit whatever my standard of perfect is just get it done do whatever the best you can at the time is release it and move on to the next thing. Otherwise, you cripple yourself with judgment and mm. you never really get anything done. And that's that's the the black part of the white perfectionist is that mm. when you're trying so hard to make everything white, you barely create anything. Nothing ever passes your standard, so you're frozen in your creative paralysis where nothing is is good enough. And that's no way to live. That's not advanced like a perfectionist. Well, this I'm being perfect, right? This is yeah. perfect. Like, no, that's not perfect. Doing that is certainly not a perfect way to be creative or to live in this world. You got to temper that so that you can actually be more productive and and uh, release things, you know, rather than, you know, parent being paranoid about the uh, having it has to be absolutely perfect. So, that's I so find. True. Yeah, I find that finding out these things about yourself, like that you're an INF, you're an introvert, for instance, or whatever, it get first, or I'm also HSP, I just found out. I'm a highly sensitive oh, yeah, person. Yeah, like different like, little <laughs> letters afterwards now, yeah. Yeah, but uh, it's very true when you read about the people that are highly sensitive, you know, I'm definitely one of these people. You name it, I'm very sensitive to it, whether it's sound, foods, and... Um, uh, people's emotions. Uh, I was going to ask you about Wi-Fi. At, at, crying at movies or music or things affect me. You know. Oh yeah, why, my mom. She again. She's a HSP as well. She, you turn on Wi-Fi near her. She knows it. We got to turn it off. Yeah. yeah. 
So there's, um, you know, some people and other people, you tell that to other people and they're like, huh, she can tell that the Wi-Fi is on. Yeah. I mean, some people are highly sensitive to various things that other people are numb to, to the point that you wouldn't even believe it. Well, they, to me, I'm so, I have really uh, good hearing mm-hmm. <laughs> and coming back home, my parents are, are flabbergasted at the things that I hear and like, I got to. I got to get them to come right next to it before they can be like, you still don't hear that? And they're like, oh, now I hear it. Like, well, yeah. <laughs> but, but for, so it's just people have different sensitivities like that. Um, but what, what I was going to say about them is when you first find out about them, it's good because you no longer feel like a weirdo or a freak or something because you're like, oh, other people are like this. This maybe is a minority thing, the INFJ or the HSP or whatever letters you want to put after yourself. What it is, is a familiarity that, okay, most of the people around me aren't like this, but there are, there is a huge sector of society that identifies uh, with me about these certain things. And so it gives you a, a, a feeling of like, okay, it's okay to be me. I'm not the weirdo. But then from there, I find that as a springboard, a jumping off point, because you don't just stay there and, and in your little yeah. fr- fringe group. No, okay, now you can be happy about who you naturally are, but then also recognize that you can develop beyond this uh, thing. And, and that's what I'm doing now, trying to, you know, for instance, doing the podcast or, um, yeah. you know, that's an extroverted thing to do somewhat, I guess, or, or even just coming out and having a YouTube channel or, or being a flat earther publicly, you know, that's an extroverted thing to do. The introvert in me would rather sit in the corner of the room quiet and not bother with all this. But there's something deep in me that knows that it's really advantageous for me to curb that natural instinct of mine and actually try to be more extroverted and, uh, you know, speak my mind more so. Uh, that's that's the thing INFJs, it's like they'll, they've got all these great thoughts we've been thinking, we've been pondering them, but then we just keep them to ourselves and nobody knows and we just We're never there. execute, we're just like, oh, I wrote it down. But. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been absolutely fantastic. I, I, I don't know what my life would have been uh, without it. At the same time, I've also realized that, is it fate? Is it just this personality thing? Are all things actually supposed to happen exactly the way that they do? Is this all possibly just the illusion of choice? Uh, you know, there's people who, honestly, they've taken it that level on the server as well, uh, going, there, there is no such thing as free will. I'm like, what? You know? <laughs> um, but then come to understand, like, I get what they're saying. Like, um, you have your personality. You, you would never do that thing that you think is possible. So is it really possible, you know, kind of thing? Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I still wonder about that. I'm, I'm not 100% sure that we all have free will. I, I think right. that it's a combination of the two. In, in other words, there are some things that are determined and there are some things that we have uh, an, a bit of free will about, though I'm, I'm open to the possibility that we don't. Because if you look at it at like a far enough back scale, you can see how everything is literally one because no two trees, two rocks, two humans, two anythings are exactly alike. Therefore, our classification of even calling two humans human or two rocks rock Mm -hmm. or two trees tree is almost arbitrary in the sense that there, there are no two things that are exactly alike. So how can you give a word, give a name to them and say, okay, these two things are the same this or that. They're not, no two things are the same. Therefore, we're involved in this one big ineffable thing, the only one true thing, which is everything, and it is acting. (laughs) And we're part of that one thing. But why do we think that our part, our subjective part that isn't even really separated from the right. one, the one, which is the only real thing in existence. Why would we think that our little part it has the, the free will to do whatever we want? We're not even really separate from the objective one thing. And now what is that like? Once again, a dream where <laughs> you could say God is the dreamer, 
and we are characters in the dream and we're doing things or we're making decisions and having conversations and having adventures and everything. So of course this is real. Of course I have agency. Of course I'm the arbiter of my own free will and whether I go left or right or whether I have this or that opinion or decision. Nobody's making that decision for me. <laughs> are they? That's that's a limited perspective viewpoint. I mean, obviously, from our own subjective perspective, that's the case. But objectively speaking, you can philosophically zoom out your life to include everything in existence. And when you do that, suddenly, maybe each of us subjective packets of consciousness here, thinking we're sub separate human entities, in a physical world, maybe we're all just in the mind of God and we think that we're a separate and individual being, but in reality we have no more ontology, like true ontological existence than characters in a dream do. Yeah. And when you die, a piece of God wakes up and realizes, oh, that was just a dream. So how Eric was I if that was the reality I was operating in? I was just being deluded <laughs> into thinking that my subjective perspective uh, is has so much power that I can do anything I want. <laughs> <laughs> when, when in reality, everything I could do or would do, these words I'm speaking are in a language that was created before my birth that was indoctrinated into me. And mm -hmm. then the fact that I would be saying these particular words at this particular time is only because of my entire life experience, which has brought me up to this exact moment where I'm talking to you and saying these exact things. And so where's the free will in all of that, really? <laughs> it's like you can see how it all trails back to a series of events that were outside of your control to begin with. You allegedly come come into being somehow, you know, that's how all that happens is you have again, no control for like the first seven years. You don't even remember it. So what was going on then? You know? Right. Yeah, exactly. So um, when I look at it, things that way, I still feel like I can be open on the whole free will versus determinism subject. And I, it's yet another one that I don't think I'm ever going to get to the bottom of it. And I think the most honest position is agnostic again. And just looking at both sides, realizing it, and then I'm kind of straddling the fence with it, like I said, where I feel like, well, I said in Asbestos Head, what did I say? Something like, from vacuum fluctuations in Andromeda to his daily decision between boxers and briefs, um, yes. he has the free will to um, flip a coin on any action, opinion, or decision. But on a large enough scale, he's like a dancer choreographed beyond his capacity to comprehend because of all those things that I said about mm -hmm. how you know, your life comes into being and all these forces outside of you that make you you and you think this is all your free will. Well, so much of what is your free will has been determined. So I think even if we do have some bit of free will, there's also a lot of determinism similar to the nature nurture thing where that one never really mm -hmm. there's no there's no black and white to it there, that is a shade of gray as well even dna changes over time you know, throughout mm -hmm. your life so your nurture changes your offspring's nature and i think it's similar with free will and determinism that they're so well intertwined that they're like two sides of the same coin almost and so i think I think maybe both is happening. Maybe both <laughs> is happening at the same time. <laughs> For well, that's why I said illusion, in my head. You know. But yeah, I get the kind of globy arguments too then, because they're like, what do you mean I don't have free will? Look, I dropped a right. pencil that night, and I'm like, yeah, but you made it a point to make the decision to make that point, you know, like, based on, that was your personality. You were going to say that no matter what, you know? Like, um, so it starts to be this, this a bit of illusion but then I also get deja vus, right? And even as a kid, I'd have these things where I lived out the entire freaking day, one day of this high school, and I was sitting there the next day, just, I remember a video you had too, where it was just like that. And I was like, I was freaking out that whole day. You're gonna say this, dude, you're gonna say that. I go, 
what the hell is going on here? You know, do we actually know what's going to happen? And we're just, we're playing games with ourselves, you know, like, I don't know, you know. Exactly. Yeah, I've had that experience many times as well. Prophetic dreams where you dream some aspect of your life in the future and you didn't know it at the time. But when it comes into existence, you're like, whoa, my dream is happening right now. Yeah. And it is the most paradigm shattering experience. I mean, still, even when it happened now, it's like I've fitted into my paradigm now because it's happened so many times. I'm starting to understand reality has to have some kind of crystallization process and consciousness is able to go outside of time, space and matter to get glimpses of potential futures that we can create for ourselves. And then based on how I lived in the moment of the deja vu, I was able to change it. Like I said, yeah. when I said the next sentence that my friend was going to say along with her, and she's just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then the, it pulled me out of the, the dream reverie moment or whatever, because I changed the, the dream in that moment. Yeah. And so, again, it's like, Determinism or free will, nature or nurture. It seems to be some combination of the two, even with when you're talking about the future. It's like mm-hmm. it's kind of there, but only if you bring it into existence. Yeah. And the reason I say that is because there's this guy on the server. I was having this conversation with him as well. And he goes, Chris, you know, um, you know, I don't tell a lot of people about this, but you can even ask my sister. And, um, you know, he's on the server. He'll, he'll know who he is. But, um he had a dream for 15 years, apparently, right? He was in like a coma and he remembers it, you know, ever so vividly, but he lived what he thought was 15 years, a completely other life, woke up and suddenly started to remember this life again, you know, when he was, when he was 19. And those, those moments kind of stick out to me as well too, because it's like, what is this time? thing right this construct that we we that seems ever so objective but at the same time could be a blink of an eye um oh i liked what you said about uh bringing it back to smaller governance at a small scale like the idea of anarchy it in the sense of no governing or no governance or no rules or no rulers it's almost I, uh, ideological to the point that in practicality it doesn't happen because no matter what people are living together in an area in a geographical location and you're going to have um, problems that arise you're gonna need to have standards or some set of rules and then you're gonna have to have punishments that people agree upon based on them so the, the structure of society the legal system governments and everything is kind of like the natural evolution of just people living together. You are going to create, construct some kind of political structure, some kind of governing thing, no matter how hard you try not to. (laughs) It'll form itself, even if you really, you try really hard not to. It's it's that human construct. It's part of you. And and it's part of interpersonal relations and, and being able to work with one another in a group setting. You can't do it without some rules without a hierarchy to implement those rules, people having uh, people need to be compartmentalized in the sense that we were just talking about where the, your role player, your role playing stats aren't the same. So you can't just let think everybody's exactly the same and have them operate doing the same jobs or whatever. You can't have me trying to repair the refrigerators and you maybe, the books. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and so you got to um, divvy, divvy the workout responsibly that way and it ends up being a society it ends up being a system of governance without you even intending it to be so and so the the key isn't to try and not govern or not have rules or anything like that but to keep it small and free so that it's not and by free i mean everyone has a voice Rather than representative government, where you got to everyone's got to vote for some guy that they don't know, that now he's the voice of everyone in his geographical location, and whatever he says goes for that. Um, the bigger an area a politician claims to speak for, <laughs> the worse it's going to be. <laughs> you got to have small governance, and you have to have an overall societal governmental structure that allows for small communities to govern themselves without having 
like for instance in America, you got the federal and the states. Mm -hmm. What is this? What is the federal government really doing? That's taking, so helpful. Taking money. Yeah, taking money, hey. parasiting off all the other states. You know, and yeah. even at the state level, that's already a. I would say that's about the biggest government you really need. Or if you wanted to have, you know, federal and government, the, the only box. reason, exactly, the only reason you should have it in existence is just as like a, a bureaucracy of a, of a way to get people, the states to come together for something if they need to. There shouldn't, it shouldn't be a all the time thing. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. and that's what they're always doing. This new world order type stuff is they're trying to find some outside entity to get us all to come together and then we'll all agree and, and fight this other thing. And that's what they need for their existence, for the legitimacy of bigger and bigger governments. They need bigger and bigger enemies to make us small communities feel like like scared and like we're not enough. And like we need the help of bigger and bigger entities to help us out. But it's always fear based. It's almost mm -hmm. always fake. <laughs> like we're, we're, humanity survives regardless of all of these. Well, then you got project Cat cataclysm. You're like, is it though? <laughs> you know, like, oh man, you know, like, are you serious? They were gonna do this, you know? And then, of course, you have Seven Eleven. You're like, of course they would. You know, um, if you had a governance that was more about that, you know, I hate as much as I hate the credit system. If we actually did good things with these technologies, they could be, honestly, in my opinion, really, really good. You know. For instance, if you had something that was able to track, like, how many compliments you gave people, and if you were getting paid for that, hell yeah, there'd be a lot more compliments flying around. You know, dude, your shoes are nice. You know, like, um, but of course there's not, and maybe that's not the point either, too. Because um, I would say even spiritually, uh, I forget what it's called, but I think there is this kind of record, if you will. There's just kind of this. I don't, I know people sort of theorize about it, but to me, I'm like, we already have this credit system too, you know? And, and in fact, if, if we, again, just change those words, that we can actually start thinking about this a little bit more and, uh, and again, be more self-aware. Mm, yeah, it could be some kind of spiritual afterlife credit that we're uh, saving up right. every, every compliment that we make. We may actually be uh, setting up a better afterlife for ourselves based on our karma or something. Um, so we may already be getting paid by a spiritual social credit scheme that we don't even know about. That seems to be what karma is. <laughs> right, right. And uh, the interesting thing about that is like, you talk about paying people for compliments or something, well then you'd worry about getting fake compliments because people just want money. Exactly. Um, and then I wonder, I scale that up to the spiritual level um if karma wasn't a thing or if people didn't think that there was afterlife heaven and hell and that you know retribution for all of their actions then what would happen because that would be like a real dream in the sense of in your dream dreams you can do whatever you want they're amoral and really it's fine because the characters in your dream don't exist it's just you sleeping there and you're having a little fantasy but us, as the characters in a dream right now, who actually feel things and we suffer and everything, uh, it's it's a it's a mind game to to really. It's, have you ever seen Waking Life, the movie? I don't think I have. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. I definitely recommend it. It's by Richard Linkletter, and uh, they there's a character in the movie who says that because the whole movie is mostly about dreams. And he says that realizing that you're a character in another person's dream, now that is self-realization. <laughs> <laughs> um, for the movie, I didn't quite get it, but for as, th as I was thinking about it and relating it to the idea of Brahma and that we are all happening in the mind of God, and that wouldn't that be quite the act of self-realization if the truth is that you are just a character in a dream <laughs> to recognize that while you're still alive in the dream then how lucid would your life become how lucid of a dream would you actually live knowing that you're just this character which right. is why again i'm always open to that determinism thing and it's like maybe 
maybe the one bit of freedom I could have in this determined life is knowing that it's determined, unlike everyone else that's deluded with their free will. And then within this determined life, I can have the free will in my consciousness to, because that's at least that's where it is, right? Feels that way. It definitely does. I can ba I can bask in it, whether it's true or not, <laughs> because it's my last bastion. <laughs> well, that's what gets me too. I mean, it's definitely that mind game because like, okay, like my dad with his near death experience, um, you know, because I've been kind of getting into that soul trap stuff too. I don't like so much the word trap, but mm. however, we're kind of trapped here, you know, <laughs> like, um, but he also talks about so much that when he met this loving light, right, and it's kind of the exact same experience. He saw kind of these entities on the side and, you know, the most beautiful, wonderful light that you've ever seen. But it also said, you're not ready to be here. Mm -hmm. it, it didn't even give him a choice. Like, mm -hmm. it was just like, no, you're not ready. And it shoved him back. Um, and, you know, he immediately woke up from a coma, and, you know, things going off and, and whatnot. Um, but that was something that always took out to me, too, is like, I don't think we do have a choice. You know, it's just kind of like you're in the dream, you know, like, and that's why there's, of course, this illusion of choice. Um, and it could be a nightmare or it could actually be a dream, right? You know, like it doesn't have to be a nightmare, but of course it's still dualistic. It's there's still pain. There's still parasites. There's still like, of course, things to learn from, um, you know, even this guy on the server would often say like, if you had nothing to wake up from, what would be the point of being here, right? If you were never deceived by the globe, um, would flat earth mean that much to you? And we're all kind of like, yeah, you're you're kind of right. Like it, it wouldn't even matter. And I've noticed that actually with my nine year old, because she's kind of like, why are you always talking about flat Earth? And, you know, like why? Because to her, it's just like, just the earth. You know, what's funny to her is that like, you know, always seeing the ball and whatnot. You know, we'll watch a movie or something. Uh, you see the Universal pictures, and we both just look at each other, start cracking up. Um, but well, that what's, that proves, like you said, that it's not about the topic at hand really it's not about the shape of the earth it's about the lie exactly. and the fact that you lived through the lie and that you actually had the trauma of being lied to and then the trauma of having the cult around you lying to you and when you just try to say hey actually this is what's true you become the pariah and suddenly and that's more trauma so people don't really look at flat earth as this th or the globe earth as this trauma-based mind control mechanism yeah. but it is and it really works on some people and especially the people who have hardened egos people who have a, a large ego are going to have a really difficult time of letting these things go because they're so used to knowing or feeling that they know and having a sense of authority behind the things that they say they're not used to the idea of radical agnosticism that i'm talking about where you really admit that you just don't know most anything. And when you can get to that stage, like I said, it destroys your ego. And then you, then, then what happens is what we've got going on now is you've got the debates, which aren't really debates because you, it's always <laughs> the same thing. Yeah, yeah, we, I, I don't, I don't, yeah. Yeah, I don't recommend flat earthers get into something Honestly, that, that could be classified trouble as a debate if if you the person you're talking to is so closed minded that the nature of your conversation is going to take the form of a debate then that person is not ready to have the particular conversation that you're having people don't want to hear that but when you look at these debates that have happened what do you see you see the egoistic globe earther overly confident about their <laughs> theories and almost always character assassinating the flat earther. The flat earther, meanwhile, usually tends to be the quieter one, the less egoistic one, the one who's ready to say, oh, I don't know, oh, I'm not mm -hmm. sure about that, uh, versus the, see, and then the globe see, earther will know. laugh, see, you don't know, you know, and he knows everything. And then any holes that you point into his logic, any skepticism that you throw his way, he just laughs it off because that's how egos deal with things that are outside of their paradigm, rather than humbling themselves to facts that don't fit within their box of beliefs. Nope, they just, they stay within their box and they laugh and they throw rocks at anything outside of it like that. 
And that's what you see in every single debate, which is why I wouldn't get into them. All you're doing is going into a battlefield with some guy that can't stand you. He thinks you're ridiculous. He thinks you're crazy. Every word out of your mouth isn't even worth him listening to. They'll talk over you. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I just watched, for example, well, do I even, I don't even want to give names. So I just watched one of the, one of them with one of the typical <laughs> globe guys. And then a really well-spoken, nice, compassionate, flat earther kind of guy that you know he'd be a cool guy to be a friend and everything versus this this globe guy who every interview that you see him in he's just he's drinking an energy drink and talking yeah. over you and laughing and <laughs> and it, it, you can't even get a single point out like i felt so bad for the guy like at the end of it he was like will you let me talk will you let me say a, a, yeah. a sentence i mean he, he even started out saying, like, can we please not do the thing that you guys always do, which is talking over us and calling us names? Can we be respectful and have a respectful conversation? And the guy said right up, he said, oh, well, you probably, I guess you haven't seen my channel. So so this this Glober, rather than accepting the terms of a, of a friendly debate where you actually listen to each other, let the person talk for a while before interrupting them, and then stay off the character assassinations calling each other crazy and just stick with the the facts and this is how he tried to set up the debate with this guy and this is the guy's demeanor oh you haven't seen my channel you don't see how i operate <laughs> and exactly for the next hour and a half until the guy rage quit well not even rage quit he's he just he canceled but he, obviously mm -hmm. he left because he was tired of dealing with this guy that was just interrupting him, talking over him, calling him crazy, laughing at him, G going back to the same point. He, you know, you try to say, start your new point, and he'll just yeah. interrupt you and say the same point. The conversation went nowhere. It was annoying to even listen to the thing. And I've seen this happen dozens of times. Every single time I have seen a debate between these globe earthers, especially the professional globe earthers, the ones that have channels based on it, and uh, flat earther this is what you get and so that's why i don't recommend entering into debate it's it's setting yourself up for something that's not productive in any way you're not going to become a globe earther again they're not going to become a flat earther that's not why you're having the debate <laughs> they're trying to convince you of your thing you're trying to convince them of their thing and neither one's going to get anywhere and you think that oh well it's for the audience really like like i said yeah. that hour and a half it was torture I don't oh know gosh! Why, the planners are like, the I can't, can't do it. <laughs> I was I was more watching it like a, like just feeling compassion for the flat earther or whatever. But mm -hmm. it wasn't it wasn't an enjoyable listen. I didn't learn anything. All it was just reinforced the fact that I would never get into these debates with these professional globe trolls. They are just and and you're just promoting them, bringing people to their channel. You look at the comments, and the people in the comments section have the exact same attitude where. They're not even interested in facts or science or anything. The whole, the whole globe MO at this point is making fun of the flat earthers. They are they have so much fun thinking that we're the dumbest people ever. And I think it may come from some again the trauma basically that they haven't dealt with their own trauma and they don't want to be that crazy person so much that they're going to be the opposite. They're going to be the one calling you crazy, even though in the back of their minds, the points you're saying that half of them have to make sense, half of them they don't have a, a good rebuttal for, and all this thing, all these things. And that's the story of everybody that does come to Flat Earth, is almost everybody has that ego defense mechanism built up where you call the first Flat Earther you come across in your life a crazy moron, and you're quite confident and puffed up about that fact. <laughs> I can't believe I actually met a flat earther in this day and age. <laughs> but then over time, that that uh, defense mechanism, it comes down. And then I have these interviews with people and I find the same story over and over again where they're saying just like that. So, oh, I was that guy. I was the guy that, was, you know, you crazy flat earther, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, we but, get that a lot too. But, but if you're genuine enough and you stick with it long enough, there's going to be cracks in that armor 
and you're going to come over to our side and you're going to have to fight the exact same battle <laughs> that you were, <laughs> you were on you know that's what we're doing right now basically yeah. is we're not um we're not trying to slay <laughs> globe earthers we're trying to win them over to our side and then we're throwing down the swords completely because that's why i said why debate there's nothing to debate let's not fight about this it's right. not productive in any way and the way to bring people over to our side isn't to fight it's right. you know, what uh, another analogy i use is preaching to the choir well it seems like oh you're in they call it an echo chamber that's the negative version of it but what i say is bring the make the choir so loud and so large that everyone walking by is just listening and like what are they singing about i just want to go there sit down and listen for a while and rather than having to have them listen to us yelling back and forth debating with people that we don't even you know they're not in our church no we 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 grow our own echo chamber and then we sing the song and and make the echo so beautiful that the people walking by that have nothing to do with uh, our choir are now so interested that they just want to see what's going on. And so I, I think that's the way forward rather than trying to be aggressive butting heads and trying to take on the professional globe earthers like, well, Eric, you've got to take on like, like it's like we've got to get our best against their best. And then and that's what's going to decide something like truth isn't decided by having Two intellectuals on it's opposite sides. Debate. Yeah, you're just presenting ideas, and, and the the ultimate arbiter of truth is always the listener. It's always the person in the audience. You're the one with the real power. The debate is just entertainment. The end result is what you think about what's been presented. And if that's the case, why share the stage with the the people you would least like to share the stage with, like the people I yeah. want to talk to are you guys. That's why I'm doing these podcasts with you guys, the the flat earthers, the, you know, the people that I consider my friends. Why would I want to spend this valuable time that I have to talk to some guy, you know, the, whose name I'm not going to mention that I'm thinking about, who's one of the most annoying globe earth trolls ever, okay, just sounds, so that he yeah. can call me crazy, talk over me, interrupt me character assassinate me and then put it out on multiple channels and then the google algorithm the youtube algorithm will move that thing to the very top it'll be the only thing that ever people ever see when they type in eric dubay you know so you got to be really careful about what you're doing and who you're sharing the stage with and right. like that so i don't think giving a platform to these people is the answer and debating them um i okay. say just let's make our own choir sing such beautiful songs you know use our own creativity to create flat earth whatever to the point that you know because you know there's people making stickers there's people making tables there's people making cad coffee CAD designs everyone's using their own creativity and, and whatever they are good at to bring to this subject and then you you push that out into the world in in various ways and it's going to have an effect and it's going to have a much better effect than just trying to bash your head against the wall with one adamant globe earther at a time, you know, break the walls down a little at a time. It's, it's not, right. nobody becomes a flat earther in a single conversation or within the conversation. So, so how could a debate ever end up well for either side? It's, you're just presenting your side. And so you're better off presenting your side by yourself without somebody else interrupting you and sharing the stage with the exact opposite viewpoint and, and trying to knock everything down that you set up instantly. Um, so I, I would say we should be more confident about having our own safe spaces and being in our echo chamber and don't worry about what they're doing over there. Right. You know, and, uh, and we don't even need to use that negative language. We can preach to our choir to the point that we're singing so loudly that everyone walking by wants to join our church. So we can use positive analogies. <laughs> this is it's the same thing. Well, I'm glad you say that just because, you know, it makes me think, because I was kind of there at the beginning of the server where it was this debate server. It was about, you know, Glow gets this five minutes, Flat Earthers get five minutes, brawl it out, right? And it was, it was actually called the arena. And, you know, that's where we had, you know, 
uh, fight the tight shirt, um, McDonald tune guy, you know, like Did they, they all come into there. As yeah, well? of course. Um, because they want the content we make them money that's what yeah. makes me absolutely right. sick I'm, right. I'm like stop giving these guys a platform stop giving yep. all these guys that are making books about bashing flatters what are you doing so we've come to the realization too that no we're going to be our choir right mm -hmm. and in fact this isn't an echo chamber um in fact by definition an echo chamber is the globe you're not allowed to talk about anything outside of that. When you go to school, you get the globe. When you turn on the television, you get the globe. Um, everything's the globe, and that is the echo chamber, if you right. will. Whereas in Flat Earth, you come in here, you're going to learn about star forts. You're going to learn about um, the claim of geometry. You're going to learn about definitions of words. You're going to learn about logical fallacies, all these different things that are like, uh, because we get it all the time. Oh, you guys enjoy your stupid little echo chamber. And, and it's like, you don't even know what echo chamber is. And mm. I'm here to like, I'd be glad to share it with you. But if you're going to be a dick, honestly, uh, get the heck out of here. You know, mm. kind of thing. That's a good um, point you make, too, is like, I think people automatically think an echo chamber just means a small group with a fringe idea. And that instantly means it's an echo chamber. But what if it's a huge group with a mainstream idea? But the, it, what you got to is the, the, the what an echo chamber really is, is all you're hearing is your own voice echoing. You're not hearing new ideas. You're not hearing anything outside of your group. And so even though the globe echo chamber is huge and mainstream, it truly does fit the definition of an <laughs> echo chamber more so than anything flat earthers are doing because 99.9% .9 of modern day flat earthers started as globe earthers. So we are the exact opposite of an echo chamber. We're the ones that stepped outside of the echo chamber and found out what else is out there. What are other people saying that aren't within these echoes? And then we found 150 year old flat earth books with people saying the exact opposite and making way more sense. And so you're right, we are actually not in an echo chamber. They are. And then what are they doing? They're flipping the script and, and constantly telling us that that's that's who we are Constant to the point that i I, I almost agreed with it until you <laughs> until you pointed that out to me and yeah that makes way more sense that they're the echo chamber we're not just because we're a small fringe group and that's right. what you identify as an echo chamber generally in this case that really doesn't fit the bill they're the echo chamber exactly but yeah you know i, I forget who it was one of the moderators who actually goes no by definition the echo chamber is is the globe side, you know, and the way he laid it out, I was like, you know, just mind blown, like, of course, like, um, in fact, what's so funny is that how simple flat earth really is, um, that is just the earth, right? And in fact, you know, just like we were saying, it could be objectively tested. Um, the other parts is just the mystery, you know, for sure. The model comes into play usually when you're trying to go beyond your bounds. Right. Usually the model is when you try to map the celestial over the terrestrial. Right. And that's the thing with flat earth is you say like, well, how can you prove the flat earth? And most globe earthers will go like this. And they're like, yeah. well, you uh, see that sun, you see that moon. <laughs> it's like, well, flat earthers, though, this is what we do because we're actually talking about the earth. So we look down and we measure and talk about the geology, we, we talk about the terrestrial, whereas almost everything globe earthers have been taught to do when proving the shape of the earth is to look up yeah. to lights in the sky and things that they're doing and relate them to things down here as if they're, it's exactly the same. And, and we've made the analogy before, it's like having a contractor come over to your house and, and asking him, what are the dimensions of the floor? And he gets out his tape measure, and rather than going to the floor and measuring from one side to the other, he goes up to the recessed lights in the ceiling, and he starts measuring the little lights up there, and then trying to extrapolate out from how many lights there are and how they're positioned, uh, about how big the, the ground probably... It's like, dude, just measure the ground. Are you kidding me? And that's after, what it's like after with he globe, does all that. He's like with globe earthers. We got a curved floor. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out the the floor is curved. Yeah. Well. <laughs> no, you're exactly right though, because we even say it too. We're like, are you gonna pull out a sextant and measure the lights in your room and be like, yep, first play. You know, no, you're just gonna measure it, man. Like, uh, 
Uh, no, I mean, you're, you're exactly right. The, we call it mind gymnastics, right? That these Globers have to take. Um, I mean, we've gone as far because especially in the heated debate, or if you will, of the discord uh, where these Globies come in, they're constantly obfuscating, constantly like, well, I'm not going to be intellectually honest and I'm actually going to answer this way. And we know that too. And so we will bring up like metaphors like your wife is cheating on you. Your best friend tells you, right? Wouldn't you want to know, like, uh, would you ask your wife, why, why did you lie? Right kind of thing. And they're like, well, my wife could be, uh, you know, having an affair with a robot. Mm -hmm. I, and my friend was mistaken. And, you know, it's just like the the gymnastics they put themselves through. It's like, dude, relax. Like, I'm not doing this to get you. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to, like, help you. And you're, going, you're like, literally like the sheep that, like, keeps getting stuck in the, in the, in the little trench. You know, yeah. kind of thing. I just saved you. You're trying to jump back, jump back in. in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I mean, at the same time, I, I wouldn't change any of it. I, I love helping, especially, I definitely like it a lot more in real life with my students that I have a connection with um, because they come back to me, you know, years later and they're like, you know, they gave me a hug. I don't even remember their name, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So and they're like, you, you helped me so much, uh, Chris. And I'm like, that's why I do it, man. You know, like, um, I want to see everybody else prosper too because I think that's kind of the, that's kind of the point, you know, in my opinion. Um, that's the it, um, the idea in um, Asbestos said I talked about uh, do good, have fun. Yeah. And I also had a chapter about uh, selfishness and selflessness and that concluded. That was one of the first books I got, yeah. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Cool. I concluded that, you know, the most, there is no truly selfless action you can take because every selfless action you take, you get the selfish joy of being the person who helped someone else. And that's one of the most selfish pleasures you could possibly have. And if you could, you'd want to give that to them too, which is why Asbestos Head tries to come up with this way. It's like it's kind of like Santa Claus, where he gives presents to people and then runs away, like do ding ding dashes them, so mm -hmm. that they have to then see this wonderful present, but then not know who gave it to them, and then have to wonder the the, the rest of their life. You know, when because when you give anonymously like that. Rather than the receiver being able to know where the target was and and give thanks to you, they basically have to give thanks to the universe, to nature, to humanity, to God, to whatever you, you'd want to say, because they don't know. It could be anyone. Anything but yourself. Yeah. Which of these wonderful people blessed my life today? And that's actually the best way you can give. But even then, you know, if you were that Santa asbestos head person doing that, ding dong dashing and running off. You can't tell me that's not one of the greatest feelings, knowing that you just did the supposedly most selfless thing possible, but you still get the selfish joy. And, yeah. and it's almost better that way. So it's like the more you can outsource your, your selfishness onto other people, and so that you're getting the selfless joy of giving to them, it's the ultimate. And so that's why do good, have fun. Both, it's the it's it's two aspects of the coin, as in, help others and help yourself. Help them have fun, and you're gonna have fun yourself. Do good for them, you're gonna have do good yourself. You're gonna have good things come to yourself. Um, it reminds me of that saying, um, you know, kill them with kindness. Because mm. I've always gotten that that kind of thing too, where anybody could come super super mad at me, and I just. Like and it destroys them. They can't stand how patient I am. They it, they eventually just go oh they go away because it's just like I can't even get to this guy, you know? Because <laughs> you start to realize that they're just putting up this front. They're just uh, a lot of a lot of people is just insecurity. They're they're rude because they're scared. Mm -hmm. They're absolutely terrified. And I, I'm like I get that man. This is a weird world. Mm -hmm. However, at the same time. There's absolutely nothing to fear. I like what you said about uh, the killing them with kindness idea and how that's the best way in, if you find yourself in debates or if you find your your friend starting to character assassinate you rather than talk about the subject at hand. Um, rather than go down to their level, if you can help it, just kill them with kindness. Like you said, is always the best way and try to not debate and and not 
get into is back back and forths about these kind of things. Let them spout out if they need to say all their globe earth rhetoric. You know, let them get it out. It's like steam out of yeah. a kettle. <laughs> they need to spout it before they can simmer down and <laughs> and start listening. Um, so and sometimes they destroy the, they destroy themselves, right? They they start going, well, you can see the curve. Well, you can't see the curve, and it's like rewind the tape. We we record this twenty four seven actually. One second, and we actually have these guys that are really good at clip cording stuff, and in minutes they'll they'll play that clip. Yeah. Uh, so, Be- being a facilitator to someone's awakening doesn't necessarily mean that you're talking the whole time. You right. find and say it's like therapy. You find yeah. that if the therapist was talking the whole time at the subject, thinking that that's going to change them, it's not really what, what works. It's the opposite. The therapist is there mostly as a sounding board, so that the the per- person the person doing the therapy actually has for the first time in their life maybe somebody who is truly listening and w- with an eye towards helping them with an ear towards helping them rather than just you know when is this guy gonna shut up why is he talking about his problems again right. you know that because that's not helpful that's that's not actually the kind way to deal with someone like that if you have the time and the energy or especially if that's your job then we found that what these people most need is a friend that will really listen to them and then once in a, a while give them a little nudge or offer them a little bit of advice or some um, exercises right. that they can practice on their own to try it try out ultimately the therapy is truly the person themselves doing all the internal work and the best therapists barely do anything at all <clears throat> um and with that's the, so true they're like Thank you, doctor. And they're like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's true. It really yeah, is. The, it um, really. And w- I had this um, example I, I wanted to share. <clears throat> I was driving down the road with my girlfriend at the time, and this truck, big truck, <laughs> passes us. Um, you know, the lanes are merging down, and we were ahead of them. But to get ahead of us when it merges down to the one lane, they kind of veered right off and did like and then pulled right back in front of us Um, and then we're like whoa that was strange and we were kind of laughing it off we had the windows up and uh, and then right after she got in front of us she it was a she she um, slowed right down and then we're like what is this got right in front of us for no reason now now she's slowing down and then so we just started putting peace sign out the window like oh whatever like we were purposely trying to transform the moment from because you know usually when something yeah. like that happens it's, it's that could be a road rage incident mm-hmm. and so that in ourselves we were trying to to do that and probably doing the peace sign wasn't the best idea because what happens next as we're doing that out the window she jams on the brakes <laughs> and stops the truck right in the middle of the road where we are and gets out of her big truck and it's just like you know, woman about our, we're, you know, early 20s, so so is she. And she starts in the middle of the road screaming at us, what the fuck, what are you doing? And then she comes over and she's like, you think you're funny with your peace signs? What the fuck is that? What are you doing? What are you trying to say? <laughs> and, and I'm just like laughing. And my windows rolled down a little bit. And I, I was just kind of like shocked and like looking at her. And she's so aggressive and like, just was not what I was expecting to to happen, and we're still in this space of like laughing at what's happening. And and as she's getting out of the car, we're like, oh my god, and we're still laughing and smiling. And then she's right in my window, and I'm still like this, like listening to her. Yeah. And and then I still didn't respond, but I've got kind of that look on my face, and I'm just looking at her as she's yelling at me. Oh, and then she and then. My girlfriend's looking at her and she sticks her head kind of in the window and she's like, do you want me to beat up your fucking girlfriend? And I just, again, I didn't say anything. What? I just kind of, just kind of moved back. And I, yeah, I think I said that. I was like, what? <laughs> like that? And then, and then she pulls her head back and she's looking at me and you can see it in her eyes, just this frustration that I'm not Face. getting mad. I mean, I'm not really not, I was in, having a really good day. I'm with my girlfriend. We're having fun. And this weird thing happens, and to me, it's still funny. <laughs> the whole thing is, is hilarious. To the point that what happens next? She spits in my face. She just goes, <laughs> and I got spit down my face. Oh. And I'm just, you just spit in my face. <laughs> and I start laughing at her with 
saliva running down my face. And this woman just looks at me. Her eyes just blaze rage. And she does this <sighs> motion like a like a child's tantrum. Yep. She stomps a foot <sighs> and goes back to her truck and speeds yeah. off. While I'm just sitting there looking at my girlfriend with a spit in my face laughing. Like, <laughs> what the <laughs> fuck just happened? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> and... But now it's you know that was 20 years ago probably and I, it's now a story that i can tell and i don't know if you know if that happened again that i would be so <laughs> but imagine how much worse it would have been though if you were like all right let's step out you know just start you know exactly start if it was a man yeah. if it wasn't yeah. a 20 a something woman i probably wouldn't have i would have been a bit more right. scared for myself and for my girlfriend and i probably mm -hmm. would have situated myself pad. differently yeah, it's kind of like, oh, but back. then it probably would have been worse which is what i'm trying to say is that the if i had responded in any other way i probably would have made it worse and even if it was a, a man or something trying to initiate physical harm being the de-escalator in the situation is always the position to be in the other person escalating it no matter what it is uh, especially from a legal self-defense standpoint you do not want to be the aggressor at any point in the interaction. And from this kind of standpoint where we're talking about killing people with kindness, I mean, that temper tantrum, that childish temper tantrum that she threw after I just laughed <laughs> at being spat in the face was, you know, the best result I could possibly have gotten from that interaction. And what did I do? Absolutely nothing. I mean, it felt like nothing. The the laughter came naturally. Yeah. The whole the smiling, everything was just part of the situation at hand, and my demeanor in it. And I felt to to this day that it's a it's a proud story that I felt like I did the right thing. I felt like I responded in the right way. But it's, you know, who who would really be spit in the face and be able to laugh at it? And like like I say, even me, yeah. I don't know that I would be able to do that every time. It's yeah. just at that time that's what happened, and I did it, and I'm proud and it worked out well and, and I have this story where I can see now that the idea of killing with kindness, the idea of trying to remain unfazed in your well-being, regardless of how much someone else is trying to tear you down, is true um, power. Yeah. You might think it's some kind of like, like I wasn't stepping into my power because I didn't spit her back at her or get upset like, like I deserve to be upset or something. I still, I don't feel anything like that about that moment. I, I felt like it was an opportunity to not be that way, and I succeeded, and I'm proud of it. And so I think that, um, you know, I can take, uh, maybe hopefully people listening can take some kind of um, uh, takeaway from that. It's very Taoist, in yeah. the sense that we always think that we have to do something, there's some action, there's something we have to say, to resolve situations. But situations come of their own accord. Like this woman, was, apparently she wanted to cut me off for no reason, and, and then she wanted to, to yell at me and then spit at me. I didn't want to do any of that. I didn't want she to have the interaction. She had a bad day and she knew who she's taking out on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we all have bad days too. She might have been in other situations, um, you know, not nearly as reprehensible or whatever. Um, and recognize that, you know, rather than in a road rage incident, some people end their lives over things like this, you know, mm. if it was an, another or guy and he gets out and then your ego gets damaged and then you get out of the car and then you knock him down and and then he gets up and pulls out a knife because he's not going to lose this fight. And then suddenly something that was not somebody cut you off. So oh, you, should, you should have saw me during the 2020 thing because the first week I was still going to the store without any face diaper. And man, some people wanted to throw hands. They were like, oh, man. you're a Trump supporter, aren't you? Yeah. And I was like, because I'm buying fruit like, without a face diaper? Like, because I'm breathing? Yeah. I mean, it was it was great. But it was also, I took it as an opportunity to go, gotcha. You know, like I get to explain all of this stuff. And even at the school, uh, I, was, I was almost terminated because all the professors... You don't care about your community. Yeah, this, this is a community college. What are you doing? And I sat there. I go, if you guys have 20 minutes, I have a presentation for you that I'd like to show you about uh, face diapers right? and, and oxygen and, you know, breathing and what our bodies naturally do. 
Uh, three of them got up and left in the first five mm. seconds. They, you know, I was like, see ya. Thank you guys for staying. And, uh, and just keep them with the kindness, you know, because it was another thing. Nobody saw each other smile. So there was this real depression, I, I would say, for a lot of people that year. They didn't know what was going on. It makes me wonder if um, whether it might just be the human construct that's sort of dividing us or, you know, maybe even something more nefarious, uh, just because we've we've talked about controlled opposition. Um, and I, I kind of wanted to hear maybe your opinion on that, too. It was actually one of the discord questions um, basically saying, do you feel that the flat earth movement um, is possibly being used for this new world order sort of uh, synergy, for instance. Um, that, for instance, they could come out and go, look, guys, we lied to you. The Earth is flat. That sort of gets everybody together. Uh, boom, new world order, uh, which is kind of my dad's thing also. He's like, how do you know the flat Earth isn't just being used for the new world order? I was like, because there's a lot of opposition, but I don't know. I'll ask Eric. Yeah, he's kind of the guy. You know? <laughs> Well, I mean, from my personal subjective standpoint, like I said, I was just curious about this subject and started reading about it and finding out about it until I figured out that it's real. And then I started making a big noise about it on the internet to the point that now it's become a worldwide phenomenon. But so to ask me, like, do you think the elites uh, planned flat earth to bring us all together into a new world order? No, <laughs> I, yeah. figured, I figured it out sitting in my bed reading books. I mean, it has nothing to do with the New World Order unless people want to say that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a gen five star general in Thailand. I live on a military base and I'm my wife is his daughter and all this stuff that they make. He up got two hundred thousand dollars yeah. from a vaccine injury <laughs> settlement to become the CIA paid spokesperson for the flat earth. So uh, if you think that about me while, while I'm here in my parents' basement, with, like, right. yeah, yeah, that's that's me. I'm that's you I'm that me, guy. Guys. Yeah, you yeah. got me. I'm <laughs> I'm doing this for the money. Clearly, <laughs> like right. no, I mean that's not me. But what I would say is that yeah, there's been clear controlled opposition come into the movement since then, and could they, on the movement's eventual success, co-opt it and then use the unification as some kind of justification for a new world order and have you know mark Sargent be the, the king of the world because he figured out flat earth and brought it to everybody you know if that was the case then yeah <laughs> oh he gave me a world show. he shares his number and his address <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's so personable no i mean i mean if that happened then yeah i'd definitely be like okay <laughs> this is definitely a, a plan but it was it would have been a co-option not a plan from the get-go because when i started this nobody was doing this nobody was talking about this so there's exactly. no way that this was a original plan that the original new world order plan was to externalize the truth of the flat earth through eric dubay and then we'll get a new world no that's not it but and what it always sounded ridiculous you know but i was like well i'll ask him you know <laughs> i mean on that that <laughs> that version of it is definitely not the case but what i'm saying could be is they could piggyback onto what we're creating here with their own controlled opposition movement right. and then have the success of both movements fuel their next thing that they spring off to, which could very well be like that. Well, we need a world government of flat earthers or whatever. We need to take over the UN as flat earth, you know, sounds right. pretty far, far fetched. But if that happened, then I would be uh, sounding the alarm bells. I would be the yeah. first one out there saying like, no, this is not <laughs> the real flat Earth movie. Like, as, as you know, hand in hand with flat Earth for me has always been smaller or no government. I'm not right. into this world government thing or big government solutions to anything. I, I want you know individual solutions for things, freedom, the ability to solve things for ourselves rather than have somebody on high dictate down to everyone how we all have to do things as a world society. Now let's get back to small geographical locations and everyone can do what they deem fit for their area rather than have somebody in the UN deciding for the entire world. That's never going to work out well. Right. No, I mean, I completely agree just because, like I said, people kind of come at this at different times. And when I was first, you know, doing Flat Earth and realizing you're the first video I saw, right, there wasn't this like uh, some other guy 
debunking, you know, they're like, I didn't even hear the word debunk yet until like, you know, 2017. Mm. Um, but, you know, because my dad is just kind of this, he's, he's pretty skeptical too. So he's always kind of bringing this up. Well, you don't know, Chris, um, you know, but I go, well, Eric is really consistent though, which is always what I've really appreciated about your work too. Um, you're not sort of flipping, flopping, going back and forth between things. It's just consistency. Right. Uh, talking about the truth and nothing but the truth. Um, even the wild speculations that come out with more lands. I have no idea where people are getting these maps like <laughs> yeah, uh, coming out of the ether. <laughs> I'm like, because I'm a designer and I'm like, I know this ha had to be designed. Like, come on. I'm like, who did it? Let me know, because it looks like it was made in paint. You know, <laughs> um, that's uh, that stuff. I try and tell my dad that could be kind of controlled because I do think the end game, at least uh, at least according to Warner Von Braun and his secretary, or however true that is, that their final card is this alien um, New World Order, right? In my opinion, I think it's this Ronald Reagan thing. Oh, I wonder what would unify us the most if we all had a common enemy. You know, it's always this common enemy, whether it's invisible or an, an actual thing. Um, but to me, I'm like, that seems like a better play for them than trying to swing up flat earth. And because otherwise, they wouldn't put so much money, they wouldn't put so much resource, they wouldn't put all this stuff to like discredit us and laugh at us. And I, I don't have a lot more to say. I mean, the, we've already kind of went over, um, you know, the questions and things like that. And honestly, I feel like I could talk to you all day, but I guess I had um, one more thing um, that maybe we haven't covered. Um, the aliens are coming, right? It's supposedly what they're saying. How, how or if do you, you think this alien invasion is going to happen? Do you think it'll play out? Um, maybe your thoughts and speculations. Mm. So I agree with what you said about the Ronald Reagan speech where he's talking about the off-world enemy to unite humanity. Again, they're always looking for that. And the CV thing that just happened for three years. That is the invisible worldwide enemy that everyone needs to be scared about. And now we can't even, you know, you can't hug your grandma and you got to wear a muzzle and you got to stand six feet apart from each other. You can't talk because the saliva is going to spew out on other people and kill them, apparently. So, wow. I mean, six I was, feet, guys. Yeah, oh, six, of course. Of course, six feet, not five, not seven. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, like that. The they're so good at creating worldwide enemies. Uh, well, the meteor, uh, Verna, Verna Braun Braun said, would be the other one, which they're constantly, you know, scaremongering about that there's mm -hmm. this or that asteroid that's coming so close and it's going to impact us and it's going to be a world killer and all this. And then you got your world wars was the the twentieth century version of the worldwide enemy. And I think, yeah, the, I mean, yeah, yeah, well, the 21st century version is probably going to be this, the off-world space enemy. And that's why we've got the Space Force forming, and we've got these news stories happening more and more. Have you been seeing them about the, yeah. the government well, coming out? Just because the Discord um, is like, oh, it's, it's going to happen, guys. Yeah, they're all coming out claiming that they saw, you know, oh, they were biological entities. Were they aliens? Uh, they were non non human biological entities. You see, they're, they're doing these. They seem like scripted uh, congressional hearings or whatever with supposed whistleblowers uh, coming out with the fact that yes, they've recovered alien bodies from right. unidentified flying objects. And I mean, right from the begin, the first one, the Roswell one, it already seemed like a controlled opposition mm -hmm. thing to me, where they give you the news on the first day and like aliens landed, bodies recovered. And then the next day they say, uh, false alarm, uh, it, was, it was just a weather balloon, and there's nothing to see here. And, but that's just the Hegelian dialectic. The person who, who the, what, what happens is you've got the thesis and the antithesis, and you get the synthesis result, which means the first thing is aliens have landed, and everybody thinks that that's, somebody's blowing the whistle, that's the, the real scoop. And then the next day, oh, they're covering it up. They're trying to say like, no, no, it was just a weather balloon, mm -hmm. nothing happened. And so the synthesis result in the person reading the newspaper at that time is, ah, aliens are real and they did land and the government's covering it up. And now right. we're here we are about 90 years later and it's the exact the same narrative. 
aliens have landed and the government's covering it up, but there's a few people, in, a few good people in government who are coming out and blowing the whistle. And that's how the controlled opposition always works. They always come out as the whistleblowers. They've got the special information, the inside source, so they have to be the authority figure. And now we have to listen to their authority. You know, I, that's the good thing about me is I'm just some random dude. You can call me a flat earth authority, but I'm really nobody. I'm not, I'm, I don't have any standing like that. But these Same. people, Same. right? Uh, and that is actually, in this day and age, a, a good position to be in. Really people is. people try to weave these webs of conspiracy, like I said, about me living on a military base, and I'm this, I'm a rich, um, what am I, a Monaco royalty? I'm like, Something you heard like that, that one? I'm, yeah. I'm uh, <laughs> a prince. It's a prince. I'm I'm the prince of Monaco, apparently, and so I'm I'm just flying all over the world on private jets and and all this stuff, and I'm I'm only here to delude the world with flat Earth. <laughs> so you got these narratives being played uh, on you and when you're not that way clearly then it really exposes the people trying to say these things 